Okay. Hi and welcome everyone to the um, to the office hours for I'm doing office hours simultaneously for several um, Coursera classes, uh, so I'm going to probably take most of the questions from the Q and A uh, uh, section over here. Um, give me one second. I got to get set up. Uh, file. Uh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Let's see. So um, on the QA uh, app over here, I think you can vote up and down questions. So if people can vote up or down questions, that would um, that would help me prioritize. Um, um, okay. So let me take this one first. So it says, "Hi, Dr. Caffo. Could you summarize Monte Carlo in different?" test among the whole courses. Could you give us a few extra uh, practice problems for boot camp too, just like for inference, which have the same level as that of your master student? So I'll try and come up with some more um, questions, though they may they may not have that nice format that exists in the inference class. It, it takes a little bit of doing to type all that in. But what I can do is just give you the homeworks that I give out in, in some of the master's classes I taught. And those have written out solutions, so I can do that. Let me just talk for a minute about Monte Carlo. So Monte Carlo is the process um, of using simulation to understand something where the math is too hard to do by hand. So as an example, if you want to prove that a normal divided by the square root of an independent chi-squared divided by its degrees of freedom follows a t-distribution, one way you could do that is you could do the derivation, which the combination of Fisher and, and Gossett did early on in the early uh, 1900s. The other way to do it is let's assume you knew that the, the, you had a guess that it was the t distribution. What you could do is simulate lots of pairs of independent normals and chi squares, create the t statistics, plot the empirical quantiles of those and compare them with the theoretical quantiles of the t distribution and if they lined up well then that would be it wouldn't be proof but that would be some very nice evidence of uh, what you were trying to study which is the, the distribution of the normalized statistic the the original the original use of monte carlo or one of the original uses of monte carlo Actually, I think it's fair to say the original, I, I had a discussion with a person about this, so I, th I think it's fair to say the original use of Monte Carlo was, was um, Francis Galton, and he wanted to prove things about chi-squared random variables, so to simulate chi-squared random variables, he had to simulate normals, right? And uh, to simulate normals is kind of hard, so what he did is he created um, dies that had a lot of sides, and he would roll them, and... Um, use the central limit theorem, basically use the central limit theorem to generate standard normals. He would generate these standard normals, then square them to get chi-squared. Anyway, he was doing this to demonstrate the theoretical properties of the statistics he had derived, basically the chi-squared statistic, and show that he had derived it correctly. So at any rate, the, the Monte Carlo, in across all of the classes and the way that we use it, Monte Carlo is simply the process of using simulation to understand something where the math or the computing is otherwise simply too hard, okay? And in all classes, it's used in exactly the same way. Just maybe some of the nuance for the particular setting changes a little bit, but by and large, Monte Carlo is used in an identical fashion across all of the classes. Okay, so um, let's talk about Helen's question here. So she says, hello, I think there are times when regression is not the quite, right, quite, quite the right thing to do when the assumptions are not met. Is, the same thing, is this the same thing as poor model fit? So this is a very good question. It's, it has a lot of depth. So let me try and explain it to the, to the best that I can. So there are lots of different assumptions that go into a regression model. Um, the most important one are the mean assumptions. Let me... Um, it would be nice if I had something to write on, so hang on a second, let me find... 
Yeah. I want to share. There we go. Couldn't even find that. Let's see. All right. So let me um, let me talk for a minute about regression and the assumptions that come about. So if we have a regression, the kind of standard regression um, is y equal to beta naught plus beta one x i one plus beta two x i two plus a bunch of things beta three x i three plus epsilon i, and we're going to assume that the epsilon i's are iid. Okay, so let's iid normal sigma squared. So let's talk about all the different assumptions that we've that we've made when writing this model out. Well, we've assumed that the relationship between the y's and uh, with the, between the y's and the x's is linear plus an additive error term. That's a modeling assumption. We've also assumed that the errors are independent and identically distributed, and we've made specific distributional assumptions about those error terms, including that the variance doesn't depend on the x's, right, among other things. Okay, um, we've, uh, so, so some of these assumptions are necessary and some of these assumptions are not. If, if you have a large sample size, if you're willing to make some assumptions about how the x's are being collected, then in fact it is the case that you do not have to have this normality assumption, right? You can just say that the x's are mean zero and have some variant sigma squared and the inferences and many of the confidence interval procedures and things like that that we discussed in class actually still work just fine. The linearity, um, the, 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 the linearity is a core part of regression, so if the linearity fails, then that's potentially a problem. And what we talked about in, it was a, a very highly narrow version of model selection. We said, you know, what if we include an x that we shouldn't have included, or omit an x that we should have included, but otherwise the model is right. Things are linear, there's um, additive errors, those errors are IID. Um, so it's to, it's to broadly answer Helen's question, there's a whole slew of assumptions that go into the process of statistical modeling, particularly in regression and linearity, and um, we investigated a, a highly narrow subset of those. So I would say, um, you know, it, 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 one of the set of assumptions that we talked about was having the correct set of regressors. That is an, an instance of, of having either poor or correct model fit. However, you're, you're correct in thinking that there are a whole slew of assumptions that we've made in the process of fitting regression, and some of those assumptions may be borne out, and some of those assumptions may not be borne out. Another thing I would say and this is this is uh, this point has some depth to it is it may be the case that your assumptions are wrong and you still want to to fit the regression model that you're fitting as an example you know you may ha have data that that have some that look like that and that this up and down here this cyclic pattern is real it's not just noise let's say the real noise the noisy part of it is is a little bit tiny part on top of that, right? So the noise is that, and there's this really actual systematic, there's this really actual systematic um, trend, or not trend, um, there is this really sy systematic cyclic behavior going on, but there's also a trend. And so it's not like fitting linear regression to this data where you would get that fit to the model. It's not like fitting linear regression to that data is wrong. It's that you're only interested in particular in that trend term, and in fact, you're not interested in this cyclic behavior. But you could also use regression models to try and get at that cyclic behavior. So in this case, the fitting the trend is not the right model. It's clearly not the process that's generating the data if you want to think about it mechanistically. However, it still is a useful model, and if you want to talk about average trends 
averaged over the cyclic behavior, it is the right thing to do. However, you have to think about that while you're doing these things. So anyway, my, my, my long answer, or my, I guess my short answer to your question is that um, navigating what constitutes assumptions and what constitutes d uh, analysis decisions that don't care about the assumptions and what constitutes good model fit and poor model fit is a, is a highly complicated question that takes more than a couple of you know more than a couple minutes to to actually answer. I think to really get to the point where you can navigate modeling decisions like this with with, the, with an appropriate degree of sophistication, I think is is one of the one of the very hardest aspects of statistics, and it takes and it, and it takes sort of years to master. So, um, having said that, what I would say as a as a good maybe um, as a good sort of rule of thumb for regression is to just be cognizant of the fact that you're assuming linearity, which may not hold. That there's probably regressors that you're omitting that you should probably should have included. Um, that there's also a penalty for including regressors that you should not include or er erroneous regressors to maybe look make sure you investigate your residuals to make sure your normality assumptions are reasonable and then you know or you know have a large enough sample size so that you feel comfortable that the inferences have some degree of validity despite the normality assumption so anyway what uh, so anyway uh, Helen I, I thank you for the question it's, it's it's actually quite a hard one to answer I think I've kind of talked a lot about it and probably not given you the most satisfying answer but the best thing I can say is um, model order and model choice and navigating the balance between assumptions and the goals of what you're using your model for and how you actually do it is is probably the single hardest topic in all of statistics. Let's see. Uh, let's see. How does a complete so how does a complete data science course differ from a full time master's? Actually, we were just having this discussion just a minute ago, which is kind of interesting. Um, so, let's see. It, it, um, so I presume what you mean is how does the data science specialization on Coursera that we're teaching differ from what a biostat master's degree would get here at Hopkins or a stat master's degree in general would get? Um, it, it's it's actually quite different um, in many respects. First of all, our SCM degree here, which is our kind of core master's degree, it, it has a lot more math. It has a lot more math. You, you, you would have to, at, the, at a starting point, you would have to have linear algebra and calculus to even uh, enroll in the program. Having said that, this data science specialization teaches a lot more tools. I think a lot, you know, it, our SCM program doesn't teach as anywhere near as many as, of tools that this program does. A more direct comparison would be how does this data science com program compare with other data science master's degrees? The, the, the problem with that is that data science is, a, is an evolving field and it's not clear what it's defined as. So if you compare our online data science program with, say, Berkeley's in-person data science program, there's some overlap but not a ton of overlap. Some of the core component, you know, every data science program is going to contain classes on um, prediction and machine learning, but not every data science pro program is going to contain a class on inference like we do. So what I would say is what we have is a very statistics-focused data science program, and I would say it is, you know, a fairly reasonable approximation to a one-year master's program. It's a it's a it's a pretty reasonable approximation. If you can master everything in the nine courses and do a good capstone project in this specialization, it is you know I would you know the the the, the different the main difference is evaluation that you know being online the the rigor in the evaluation isn't quite as hard or quite you know it's, it isn't quite the same. But if you can master the material, it, it's fairly equivalent to a to what I would consider a one-year master's in data science would be um, given that 
the data science program was offered by statisticians, right? This is, you know, it, it's, it is very different from what a data science program would be if offered by computer scientists. And that's just a part of the fact that, that the term data science has simply not annealed into a single unified meaning that, that means the same thing across all, lots of people. So uh, what other courses do you recommend other than Coursera's data science specialization for a person to be professionally ready for a job? I guess, you know, the big question, of course, with that would be what job? So um, I, I, I'll give you this bit of advice. One, one thing that when we put this program together and we talked about it with industry, some of the feedback we got, the, 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 some of the big missing components that people want is Python was one. They were very happy that we taught a lot of R and they like R, but they also wanted people to know some Python. And the other thing was was a little bit more legitimate database knowledge. Not So we teach how to pull data from databases and that sort of thing, but we don't teach people how to create data, databases. So um, we don't teach some version of SQL or something like that. So uh, those were two things that I think I, I would focus on that that appear to be important to data scientists. I would, you know, I would make sure to differentiate these the two the terms data science and, and big data seem to get conflated a lot, but they're not the same thing. When we when I think of a data scientist, I think of a person who analyzes a lot of data, you know, does a lot of uh, things things like analyses. Whereas a big data expert is a person with a, a huge set of highly specialized skills. They might know Hadoop, they might know a lot of parallel programming, they might know some really um, highly specialized database tools for large data sets. So a big data expert, is, a, is a, to me, is a, is a different animal than a, than a data scientist. A data scientist is an analysis expert. Um, it, it, I think of a data scientist as an, as an, an, an analysis expert who's, a, who's kind of a master doer, right? They, they get things done. Um, and, and that's, you know, they know a lot of tools, as an example, uh, for analyzing data. So at any rate, the, the two big ones that, that people seem to want when we talk to companies, we've, we've talked to several ones, I, I don't think I can name them, um, but uh, they, a lot of them wanted Python and a lot of them wanted, wanted more, some more database knowledge. And, and Coursera does have courses on, on both those things. We didn't teach them because, you know, we don't, you know, I mean, we, we wanted to be, to be very specific about teaching the things that we know well. And then, you know, I think if you wanted to work, you know, in the, in, in, as a, in a job that was highly statistics focused and, and was not at all, had, was, you were a data scientist with very little of the computer science engineering component to your profession, then you wouldn't even need those two classes. I think the classes that we taught would, that we teach would, would, be, would be pretty good for, for doing that sort of thing. Okay, so um, can you explain why the variance is the expected squared distance from the mean? Um, I get why it's the expected distance, but why the square? So you could let's. Um, so this is a question from James. We could we could define James's variance as the expected distance where it's a different distance, right? So the squared distance is a is one. You could you know do the expected absolute value distance would be another variance. Both of them would. Um, and you could take a different distance. You could do, and there's all these metrics that 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 have been defined in mathematics. The taxicab metric. You take the expected taxicab metric distance, or something like that. Um, all of them would define something that constitutes variation. The the reason that we do the variance is it it has um, some nice mathematical properties, right? Variances add, so you know, it, and um, the squared Euclidean distance, you know, has some historical counterparts in the world of physics that got ported over physics and kind of historic mathematics that got ported over into statistics. But it is just a definition and it's a convention that everyone uses. There's, but there's many other ways in which you could define variation. In the same way, there's more than one way that you can define the center of a distribution, right? That, you know, um, we simple we labeled the mean of the distribution as the integral um, x f of x where x is the 
the density. But the median, we could could be, you know, the, the median is another measure of central tendency. The mode is another measure of central tendency. All of them um, get at a different quantity. And the same thing goes for variances. You could take any population quantity that measures sort of how spread out and how thin the density is. And so, um, you know, I think it's it's pleasant too that that when you define moments, so-called moments of the distribution, the first moment is, is expected value of one. I mean, the zeroth moment is expected value of one. The first moment is expected value of x to the first power. The second moment is expected value of x to the second power. The third moment is the expected value of x to the third power. The fourth moment is expected value of x to the fourth power. So at any rate, if we were going to define a, a centered moment, basically um, expected value of x minus mu, raised to the kth power, then um, then it, then it makes it sense. Then it makes sense to 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 do the square distance, not the absolute distance. So another way in which this comes about is if you think about moments of the distribution rather than you, you know uh, expected value of x raised to the kth power, and so the variance is just a, a, you know a, basically is the second moment. Then the skewness is the third moment. The kurtosis is the fourth moment, and so on. Now, th th there's some normalization that happens, but um, at any rate, the, the reason, uh, I think those are m some of the reasons why we do the, the variance is the distance, but it's, it's a definition in that you, you, could, you could have other, distance, other expected distance metrics that would also be measures of the spread of the distribution, but by convention and by, uh, you know, for the reasons of several mathematical properties, we elect to choose or we choose to use the squared distance. Um, so, it, you know, I mean, the short answer to that is just accept it. <laughs> so, I hear a first year stat or econ PhD is rigorous math. True. Um, how should I catch up on that? Books, class, work, and research, what's the best route? So, if you want to get a PhD in stat or math, then um, I'm sorry, a PhD in stat or econ or, uh, you know, kind of re related related fields. Um, I would, let's see, I, I can tell you this for stat. I actually direct the graduate programs here, so I can tell you this, what I tell people for stat. At a bare minimum, you need calculus, single variable calculus, multivariable calculus, and you need to know it well, not just know it a little bit. You need to know linear algebra, and again, you need to know it well, not just a, a, a little bit. You need to know linear algebra. And then for any stat or econ PhD, you would want some theoretical, um, some, some uh, theoretical proof-based math courses. And the kind of canonical hard proof-based math course that everyone sort of takes and then across all universities tends to be the, the single hard canonical proof-based math courses is a course called Real Analysis. So lots of graduate curriculums look for that class, Real Analysis, just almost, a, you know, it, it is to math kind of what, you know, a hard organic chemistry class is to biology or uh, data structures and algorithms are to computer science. So um, if you wanted to, I would, yeah, I, I would take a course in Real Analysis. You know, I think if you're talking about getting into PhD programs, you probably need to take a lot of this stuff, not online, but in a, for actual degree credit where you can have a professor write a letter of recommendation. Um, but, you know, um, I think, you know, this increasingly also programs are changing what their entrance criteria are. And, you know, I think a lot of programs are becoming less math focused. However, I would still say, at least definitely for ours, that, that you know, first of all, as a bare minimum, no calculus and linear algebra very well. And then some amount of proof-based math classes would, would, be very, would be very helpful. So apart from the course project, what is the best platform to practice what we are learning from this class? Um, so I don't know which class is this class, but I, let's assume it's regression and machine learning. And um, so, yeah, these Kaggle competitions are great. They are, um, they, they, you know, they, I, I do them every now and then, and they're super fun. Um, you, you learn so much about a data set when you engage in a competition. 
but but it, it's it, what's interesting is the competition itself. You know, the the best algorithm that wins the competition usually doesn't kind of scientifically explain the most about that problem. It, but but in the process, you know, everyone who put a legitimate effort in the competition learns so much about the data. So we've done a couple of big competitions, one in my area, this ADHD 200 prediction competition, and one, the big heritage health um, competition. And uh, we learned a ton just by doing it. And and I would, so I would highly recommend doing a Kaggle competition just, you know, and, and not stress too much about how you place because, you know, I can tell you we won the one ADHD competition and we placed well out of a lot of teams in the Heritage Health one. And I can tell you that the way you do well in the competitions is tends to involve a lot of shenanigans. You, um, you know, you have to, you know, for example, I'll give you I'll give you the best example. In the ADHD we were, competition, we were looking at uh, kids with attention deficit disorder, and we were trying to predict who had attention deficit disorder from functional neuroimaging measurements. And so what we focused on is we thought. This has, and this has nothing to do with the biology of ADHD. We thought ADHD kids are going to move a lot more in the scanner. So we spent a ton of time just trying to detect motion in the scanner, which has nothing to do with biology. You learn nothing about ADHD from doing that. But it's predictive, and it helps in the competition. The other thing is, um, you know, sites. Some site demographics differed, uh, and, and that was highly predictive of ADHD, but it just meant that whatever site was contributing the data tended to collect more ADHD kids. And so um, those sorts of shenanigans are what win you the competition, but in the process of doing the competition, you learn so much about the data. So even though we won the competition, which in itself was, you know, there's a lot of noise up there in the rankings toward, you know, there's very small changes so that there's very little um, there's very little that differentiates the top couple of teams, so there's some luck involved there too, but there's also a lot of shenanigans. But everyone who was in those top couple of things, they published a lot on that data set afterwards because they learned so much about working with it. For example, we learned really well how to handle the motion in that data set so that when we really wanted to look at ADHD, we knew that our conclusions weren't contaminated by, um, by, mo by motion. So anyway, I would definitely do some Kaggle competitions. I think they're tremendous amount of fun and you learn so much in doing it. So whether it's the regression class, and, and to be honest, you'll do pretty well with just regression. You know, fancy machine learning algorithms are great, but, but you can do pretty well in these competitions if you say, I am only going to use the linear model in highly, and generalized linear model in highly um, sensible and, and thoughtful ways. You can actually do great in prediction competitions that way. But it also, if you have the machine learning, if you're taking the prediction and machine learning class, that'll help you in those competitions as well. Um, one one bit of advice I would do is use blending. That's the key. You fit a bunch of prediction models and you blend them together with some sort of cross-validation. You, you have to do that. Let's see. Oh, this one has plus six, but it just says three. Um, let's see, can you explain, here's, a, here's one that I can explain kind of easily, so I'll do that. Can you explain more about the shorthand variance expression comes from, from James? Um, let me see, that one's not so bad to just answer. Okay. Okay, so here we have expect a value of um, x minus mu quantity squared, where mu is defined as expect a value of x, it's shorthand for that. Okay, so just expanding the square, right, it's x squared minus 2x mu minus mu squared, okay. That's expected, expected value is linear, so it goes like this. Um, and hang on just a second. Okay, so, um, so the reason I expanded this expected value to the x squared and then I expanded it to this term, and then I expanded it to this term. But this term's not random, right? We've already taken out the randomness by taking the expected value over x. So x is random, expected value of x is not. Okay? Just like a coin flip, a coin flip is random, the zero one outcome of a coin is random, but saying that I, the average value of a coin is 0.5 is not random. Okay, 
So this guy is not random and the 2 is not random. So when we distribute the expected value over here, we can pull them out, right? And we get expected value of x, okay? And since this guy is not random, um, we, I just got rid of the expected value, so we have the expected value of x squared. But then this guy, we defined mu to be expected value of x. So this is expected value of x squared minus 2 mu squared um, oops, and this was a plus, right? I'm sorry, when I squared out, that was a plus. Plus mu squared, okay? And then you get expected value of x squared minus mu squared, but, you know, mu squared is... Um, mu squared is expected value of x quantity squared, just, again, by our definition. So, at any rate, um, the math works out to be pretty simple for that one. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, let's take some of these threes. Oh, a four. <laughs> okay, I worked as a developer uh, for a healthcare informatics department of a managed care company. I do a lot of analysis, use uh, bi bioinformatics, I guess, tools with SPSS. Um, the, in my work, there are no trends of using R. Can you elaborate on R's importance to other tools? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and I like it because I don't care at all about R. Um, I like R, I use R, but it's just a programming language and I've learned too many programming languages already in my life and I hope not to learn another one. Um, that's why when we teach inference, when we teach regression, um, data products is very R-centric. Data scientist toolbox is very R-centric. Our, our programming is very R-centric. But it, it, the exploring data, the reproducible research, what we're trying to teach are principles. You know, I think you could take the principles from, say, the regression class or the prediction of machine learning class. They should apply to whatever language you use. So if you, um, uh, you know, it's just like music. If you learn a little bit of music theory, right, then you can pick up a new instrument very easily and, and, and get proficient in it quickly. If all you really know is tab from guitar, you're not going to be able to pick up you know, a mandolin and learn how to play it quickly just because you're so, um, you've never actually learned the, the kinds of ins and outs of the, of the instrument uh, and, the, and the musical theory. So anyway, this is why theory, not theory, but co concepts it, are very important because concepts refile how you think about things and um, they're very portable and, you know, programming languages come and go you know, I think probably everyone in the class has seen that, you know, R is great. I love R. I work with R all the time. But R has its foibles and weird things and, and things like that. And, and R is not going to, you know, you know, there's going to be some new great thing that everyone else is using a few years from now. But I can promise you this. Regression isn't going anywhere. Inference isn't going anywhere. And so if you learn the principles of regression, the principles of inference, it doesn't matter what tool you use, you'll, you'll be fine. Now, having said that, you know, I don't know. I, I like, I mean, if I had to do a direct comparison of R versus SPSS, I don't think there would be much comparison because SPSS does not have kind of a fully featured programming language built into it the way that R does. R is, you know, is itself, R is a programming language that, that has a lot of analysis tools built on top of it. SPSS is really a, you know, a, a graphical analysis um, uh, program, and it's much harder to extend. You can, you know, you can extend R very easily. So I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even compare SPSS and R as competitors because they have such different target uses. So SPSS's competitors would be things like Minitab and Stata and um, uh, SAS Jump and um, uh, other. Uh, graphical analysis tools where the you know the the um, they're more built on the user interface than on programming. R is more you know you, you know if you want to use R you got to program. So R is more directly comparable with SAS. You know for some people it's comparable with Python. Some people do data analysis in Python now because um, there's a lot of tools that are getting built up. MATLAB is kind of a compar comparable tool to R. So, um, so I would not, any, anyway, I, so my, my suggestion would be that, you know, SPSS and R really aren't direct competitors. 
Um, but I can see why a lot of people are not switching to R because there's a there's a kind of steep learning curve for R. It's it has some weird idi idiosyncr idiosyncrasies that I can that I can relate to from my experiences learning R. Um, but I don't know. We've seen a huge uptick in R usage. Um, our most popular class is Rogers R programming class by far. So uh, we've seen a lot of interest in R. So I can say. Um, I mean, I can say confidently that that I'm not all that dedicated. I, I, I like R, but you know, um, I'm more interested in the statistical principles. Um, but I can also say that that um, from our experience and the feedback that we're getting, R seems to be um, on a sort of math massive growth rate right now. So would a Kaggle uh, project qualify for a capstone project? So do you mean, uh, so uh, let me just make sure I understand the question. So the, the capstone class, the 10th class of the series, uh, we have not run that class once, and we haven't decided the format of it. For regression, the project is kind of a simple, extremely simple data analysis based on a canned data set from within R. I, I'm not 100% sure what the project is in prediction of machine learning, but maybe that's what you're referring to. Now the capstone project, the 10th class in the series, we're working on that. And what we're hoping to have, and we want a, a single analysis that everyone goes after, and what we're looking to do is build up a relationship with an industry partner who will provide the data, and the capstone class will be based on their data um, with a high degree of interaction with the industry representative. That's what we're hoping to do for, the, for what is the official specialization 10th class, the capstone project class. That's what we're hoping. That's what we're hoping to do. And we'll have information for that. Um, for people shortly. We're, <laughs> we're actually running a bit thin right now, kind of um, doing all this um, instead of sleeping right now. And so um, we're, we're, gonna, we're hoping to run the first version of the capstone, have a quality version of it run sometime late summer, and then in early, early fall have the first capstone class run, or, or maybe earlier if we can. But it should be relatively soon that we'll be giving out the information about when the capstone class will occur and what the kind of nature of it will be. That, that should happen, happen soon. So hold tight on that. But our goal, just to give you this much amount of information, our goal is not going to be to have people bring their own data sets or find their own problem, but instead to come up with a super cool problem that's either from some you know, really nifty collaboration that we have or some industry partnership or something like that, and that way we can standardize it across people. It'll make the grading a lot easier. So if we have a small data set, can we use regression modeling to scope out what it might be having, what might be happening in the whole population? So uh, this, is a, this is a very hard question. Helen, you seem to like really hard questions. So. Um, uh, um, so, so if you have a small data set, you're kind of stuck with modeling, and modeling again is back to this hard process. So, the goal of inference is exactly to extrapolate to the population. Now, to do that, you need either assumptions or you need to design the way in which you collect the data very carefully for that extrapolation to occur. So let's talk about design first. So let's imagine that your small data set that you have, you spend a lot of time making sure that the observations in your small data set are highly representative of this larger population, right? And you did that via some random sampling. So the best examples of that are when people want to do polling or something like that. They can't ask everyone, so they have to ask, ask a representative sample. So what they'll do is they'll have highly intricate strategies for how they sample people to ask them who they're going to vote for. That, those strategies are, are quite hard, and it's an entire field of study in itself. And they 
work on it, you know, night and you know, all the time. Like that's the that's the lion's share of that work is the design, the study design. Okay, and if you've done that, then you you really need relatively few assumptions to extrapolate to your population. You can use that small data set and extrapolate quite easily. If you're like most people. In most instances, your small data set came to you however, and now you want to generalize to the population. So one way you can think about it is um, I'm using my regression model to investigate a mechanistic relationship. So for example, if I'm looking at Hooke's law, which relates the, you know, how much you stretch a spring to the force, right? Um, I'm, I'm hoping that that physical law generalizes beyond my data and that I'm using my data to, to look at it. But that's an assumption. When, when we make the assumption that the errors are IID normal draw, drawn from a population, right, and we have the mechanistic part of the model that is the linear model, th those are all assumptions. So uh, what I would like for you to get from this class is, yes, you can make these generalizations, but those generalizations come at the cost of lots of assumptions, and you should be cognizant of those assumptions and be aware of the limitations. If you want to um, to, to investigate the relationship between height and weight in adults, and you sampled all NBA players, then that, that you, you, you might get a great regression model fit, but that may not generalize to the population given the sample that you collected. There's also a lot of other things like missing data, right? If you, you know, for example, this happens a lot in the world that I work in. If you're, if you're investigating a clinical trial and you give a treatment to a lot of people and you give a drug to a, you give a placebo to a, to a lot of other people and you've randomized it and all the people who um, didn't get the treatment, they were unblinded and they knew they didn't get the treatment, a lot of them dropped out right that missing data process may impact your findings or what if you all your sickest people in your treated group all your sickest people just don't follow up they don't come back to get monitored because they're so sick and they don't want to come back for some medical study right so then your treatment looks better than it should because all the sickest people dropped out so another aspect is handling missing data and things like that so so anyway um, Again, I, Helen, I wish I could give you a, a, a nice simple rule, but this stuff doesn't have simple rules. The, the basic truth is you can use the whole point of statistics is to use your data to generalize to higher principles, to generalize to parsimonious knowledge that is permanent and to, to generalize to populations. And that process is the kind of secret sauce. And, and what we're hoping by you taking these classes is you learn a little bit of the assumptions that are necessary to start trying to work in that direction. You know, and, and what I would say in your, um, in your small data set, if you have a small observational data set, you know, you're going to have to do some modeling and make sure to evaluate the, your normality assumptions, make sure to think about how the sample occurred and what the way I like to the, the way I like to do this the best is to do my regression analysis and then either me personally or have others critique what I'm doing as as a you know so let's suppose I found some association that I want them to critique it and tell me why it's possible that I could have found this association just from the data and that it wouldn't generalize and so you want to think when you do your regression analysis like a reviewer, like a critic of the work and, and say what could explain that and in some cases you can address, you can address that in your data set so if for example um, if for example uh, you know in, you know in a lot of my um, studies what, what people concern themselves about is omitted variables that should have been included so I might say oh well this brain region is its size is associated with disease, and someone might say, "Well, you know, did you incorporate how big people are, how big their head is, right? Maybe it's brain size relative to the size of their head." Well, that's something I can address for, right? Because I'll have some measure of the size of their head. I can put it in the model and see if holding head size constant, if this brain region still is associated with the disease. So there's an example where I can adjust for it. If they're asking about something that I didn't collect then I would have to, you know, work on my argument or, or you know, uh, uh, um, just own up to the limitations of the data analysis that I did, that I did. But this is the, what you're asking is, is basically the crux of doing 
data analysis. It's it's the it's the hard part. Um, but what I would hope most is that you would you would be cognizant of some of the assumptions that goes in go into trying to make that generalization. If you don't want to generalize, I think this is one thing that comes up a lot in this data science specialization, is some people are only interested in what's going on in their data, and then that's fine. You don't need a lot of the tools that that I'm teaching. I think I, I'm I'm kind of doing all the inference related things in the in the in the class. If you don't want to generalize to a population, if you don't want to generalize beyond your data, if you want to do everything in a kind of saying this is what happened in my data set, and you don't even want to say probability or something like that, then it then it doesn't matter. But if you want to do something like what you're saying you want to do, then then yeah, all these all these intricate concepts and, and you know to be honest kind of difficult concepts come into play. Can you explain how maximum likelihood so likelihood and maximum likelihood are used in practice praxis? So actually likelihood uh, likelihood is less so used in practice with with maximum likelihood being its biggest success story. If you ever fit a generalized linear model, if you ever do logistic regression, Poisson regression, any of those things, they exactly get those estimates via maximum likelihood. And it's not like in linear regression where there was a different motivation, right? The original motivation for linear regression was least squares. And it turns out that least squares is the maximum likelihood estimate under normality assumptions, but the derivation involved least squares, not likelihood. Generalized linear models, the actual derivation, the, the direction that that work came from was from the concept of maximum likelihood. So if you type GLM in R for a binary regression or a Poisson regression, that came from the concept of, of likelihood. Anyone who's a Bayesian is directly using the likelihood. Anyone who's a Bayesian. Okay, so any Bayesian analysis you've ever seen or anyone who uses the term Bayesian or anything like that, they are directly using the likelihood. They are taking likelihood times prior to get posterior. So, so in that sense, likelihood is very common. Direct use of the likelihood for analysis in the way that I taught in the inference class is very uncommon. Very uncommon. And I, there are, there, the, the professor next door to me is a very deep thinker about the foundations of statistics. And there is a small group of people that believe the entire field has gone astray by placing so much emphasis on hypothesis testing. And that the, the real core concept that should be thought about is, is, is likelihood. Um, but it, that's maybe a bit extreme. Having said that, the likelihood is actually in every paradigm of statistics, hypothesis testing, frequency style statistics, Bayesian statistics, and of course likelihood based statistics, in all of these cases the likelihood is a central concept under the hood. Maybe not, you may, be, may not see it when you do uh, a, 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 a standard hypothesis test, but it is a core concept. There's a, there's a couple of instances where it's not notably some classical non-parametrics where likelihood is really people try as much as possible to get away from mo from models of which likelihood requires a model for the most part um, but under all these other paradigms likelihood is is permeating throughout it having said that the most common use of likelihood is the maximum likelihood estimators and but those are used so you can say confidently as an example when you fit a binary GLM that that the the estimates that you're getting from that are your maximum likelihood estimates. Um, which books do you recommend to go with the data scientist specialization? Uh, there there is none, as far as I know. There's good books on inference. There's good books on regression. There's good books on machine learning. So for inference, my favorite. Uh, uh, my favorite book on it, it's hard at this level what would be the best book on inference, but I would say the course by, the book by John Rice, Mathematical Statistics and Data Analysis, a phenomenal book on inference. Regression, there's a, there's a million good books on regression. I, I happen to like this one particularly by Meyer, um, Paul, um, um, I think Ray Myers is his name, called Classical Modern Regression, I think is the name of the book. I, I like it quite a bit. Um, for machine learning, the Hasty Tipsharani book, which is even online for free, you can get. Um, 
exploratory data analysis. There's all Tufty's books. There's um, there's uh, Cleveland has a great book on it. You know, Tukey's original work on exploratory data analysis. There's a there's a book from him on that. Um, but and there's there's some great new books. There's a there's an R book a book that that mentions R a lot called Visualize This that talks about um, you know exploratory data analysis. But there is no one. I, I the other thing is the Modern Applied Statistics in S Mass book. The Venables and Ripley book is a great compendium of using R for applied data analysis. Having said that, there is no single treatment book for this stuff. What, what we're hoping to do, we're, we, we've kind of run the limit of our time at this point, but what we're hoping to do is to create a, a series of short books that we, um, you know, we sell on Amazon for a dollar or two dollars or something like that um, to, to, for the specialization. So we're hoping to we're hoping to do that, and we have some some time dedicated over the summer to do that. But there is no single treatment, single best treatment. So would it be possible to work on a capstone project if you aren't going the verified certificate route? Um, that's an interesting question. So so what you mean? I see. So uh, I don't know. So I don't know the answer to that. Right now, we have no option for a graded, peer-reviewed capstone project through for the whole specialization without going through the series certification. Um, let me let me think about that. Um, maybe I'll I'll be back with the ne the next office hours. But but as of right now, you know, we're kind of working within Coursera's structure, and Coursera's structure is 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 kind of how we set it up. So right now, there is no. There's no outlet for that. Of course, there's nothing stopping you from doing it, but I know what you're saying. You want the benefit of the class, the forums, the feedback that you get from one another from peer grading, and there is no structure for that. I'm wondering if some informal system could be set up, you know, like a Google group or something like that, um, but that, that's an interesting idea. Um, So for the T distribution, why do we always use degrees of freedom n minus 1 but not n? So it's important to think about what is a T distribution. A T distribution is a standard normal divided by the square root of a chi-squared divided by its degrees of freedom. Then that T distribution is indexed by the degrees of freedom of the chi-squared in the denominator. The way the T distribution arises is if you have a normal statistic you know, estimate minus estimand divided by standard error of the estimate, and you swap out that standard error with the empirical standard error, that tends to sometimes have a T distribution. Because the square root of a chi-squared divided by its degrees of freedom, um, uh, um, that's, what, that's what tends to get divided in the denominator to get rid of that standard error to turn it into a T statistic. Because of that, um, it's really the degrees of freedom of the variance estimate. So the, the, there's the, the mathematical reason, um, which is uh, that the chi-squared distribution is indexed by a, a number. We call that number degrees of freedom. That degrees of freedom works out to be n minus 1 for the chi-squared distribution associated with the variance. That's something you could just stomach and just say that's what it is. But I, my guess is that you want some intuition between, behind what does degrees of freedom mean which, by the way, doesn't really have a tremendously unified single definition. Um, and where's the intuition? So I think the intuition that's usually given in introductory classes is that degrees of freedom, you lose a degree of freedom because you have to estimate the mean. So in the variance, the, the true variance is expected value of x minus mu quantity squared, right? And if we had mu, if we had mu, we would estimate that directly. We would take the sum of the squared deviations of the data around the true value of mu. But because we don't have mu, we only have because we only have x bar, we swap out mu with x bar. And the idea is that you've sort of lost a degree of freedom by estimating that parameter. And the way you can think of it as, as a degree of freedom is that the residuals, which are the quantities that make up those deviations that you square to get the variance, those residuals if you know n minus 1 of them, you know the nth one, right? So, if, so your residuals, they have to sum up to 0. So just take this. Take, take, take a vector in R and subtract off the mean, okay? And then the variance is the, the 
almost the the average square deviate the average of the squares of those things. Okay. So take a vector, subtract off the empirical mean of that the the the, the x bar from that vector, and then you'll see that they'll add up to zero. Okay. So because they add up to zero, that means if you know any n minus one of them, you know the nth one, right? And that's where you get degrees of freedom, right? That if you know and the, the, the term comes from. So anyway, that's, that's the intuition as to why you lose a degree of freedom in the sense that you don't really have n data points when you think about the deviations. You only have n minus one of them. Because if you knew n minus, any n minus one of them, you'd know the nth one. So you don't really have n independent bits of information. You have n minus one. So that's the intuition, but the mathematical fact is the chi-squared is labeled by a term called degrees of freedom. That term, degrees of freedom, gets ported over to the t-distribution, and it turns out to be labeled for n minus 1 in, the, in this case. Okay. So there's a question of when is your next office hour. I've been, you know, I try to hold them every Friday at 11 is what I've been trying to do. So I'll try and do it. If I, if I cancel... If I cancel an office hours, I try and make it up. But if I can't make it up, then I'll have it. I'll have it the next week. Um, so I have an MS, a stat MS. I'm looking for a research position to apply a PhD in a year or two. Um, what are your advices? Make sure you know calc well. Make sure you know linear algebra well. Uh, make sure you've taken some hard programming class. Some some have some legit programming experience in. R and ideally you'd have a compiled language like C as well and then make sure you've taken some proof based math classes um, real analysis for example uh, make sure you have good letters of recommendation uh, from your hard classes um, and um, good letters of recommendation um, you know write a nice letter do well on your GREs that's those are the things that are going to get you into good to a good graduate program um, and some of those are under your control, some of them are not. Your grades are in the past for a lot of your transcripts, and they are what they are. And you'll have to, you know, take maybe take some new classes um, to counteract them if you if your grades in the past are a little bit tough. Um, but anyway, those those are what, that's what people look at. Um, I think you know the amount. You know, one thing one thing that's interesting to note is you know I. The amount of time that, that people devote to applications, for a lot of them, it depends. For some applications, people are devoting, you know, a half hour. But some applications, you know, just by volume, people can only devote five, ten minutes to, to an application. So you want to make sure there's nothing that just eliminates you from consideration um, right off the bat. So what is the order of the classes? So we have this... Um, so we have this chart. You can take the classes in the order that they're given, 1 to 9. You can, you can do that. Um, but then also in every class there is a, um, it, it lists the prerequisites. The, you got to take data scientist toolbox first and you need R programming. Those, those two are essential for basically every other class. But you can take those two concurrently. Um, then, you know, for in, inference you need those two. For regression you need those two in um, you need, for regression, you need those, those two, and maybe it's nice to have the reproducible research one. The reproducible research one depends on those two classes, data scientist toolbox and R programming. The um, exploratory data analysis class depends on R programming and uh, um, data scientist toolbox. Developing data products, you really need to know R programming, data scientist toolbox. It would be nice to have the reproducible research class, um, but you really just need to know a little bit of the re reproducible research class. It would be nice to have the, the the exploratory data analysis class too, just to have some be used to creating plots. Um, so you can definitely take them in the order that one through nine that they're given. But number one, make sure you know the first two: data scientist toolbox and R programming before you do anything else. And then after that, there's there's some fudging. I think it's another hard another hard requirement is you have to do inference before regression. You can maybe get by, but but I think you'll you'll do a lot better in regression if you know the topics from inference. Um, I would also say I think regression is probably useful to take before prediction and machine learning. I would say that, but I don't know that I don't know how necessary it is. But I, I, my thinking is that you should learn regression first, and then learn the complicated prediction and machine learning algorithms. Um, 
done. Okay. Is a p-value a kind of likelihood? So my um, my colleague next door, um, this question, his face would turn bright red, which is a great question. He's so adamant um, about the the idea that p-values are non-evidentiary is the term that he would use. So p-values are not based on the likelihood. And there's a, there's a highly classic example of this. So um, imagine if you want to determine if a coin is fair and someone comes into the room, picks up the coin, and flips it 10 times, and they get three heads out of those 10 times. Um, now, and the, the, the final coin flip was a head. So there's two p-values you could create on that. Under the null hypothesis that the coin is fair, you could do a binomial, right? Assume that this person has, had intended to flip the coin 10 times and they happen to get three heads. Or you could do another p-value would be based on the negative binomial. You might guess that this person was going to flip the coin until they got three heads, right? Those are two different distributions. Flipping the coin until you get three heads is the so-called negative binomial distribution. Uh, flipping the coin ten times and you happen to get three heads is based on the binomial distribution. You calculate the p-value in either of those settings, you get a different answer. So in, his, in, in my colleague's mind, that's very condemning of p-values because the important information is that the coin was flipped ten times and that there was three heads. So any answer that depends on the intention of the coin flipper can't be valid. So p-values can't be valid, or they can't be evidentiary, would be his, his term. Um, the likelihood is invariant to the intention of the coin flipper. It's invariant to that. So that's a huge distinction between the p-value and the likelihood in that the p-value does not depend on so-called the sample space, um, where it only depends on what occurred, not on potential for what occurred. So the p-value, the, the big difference there is, right, the p-value depends on the potential of what occurred. If, if, if the person was flipping until they got three heads, they could have flipped it 20 times, right? It's unlikely, but it could happen, right? And the p-value has to account for the possibility that that could have happened. Um, uh, but the, but if, if the person was flipping in a binomial fashion, they only get 10 coin flips and that's it, okay? So the p-value is, is dependent on that design consideration. The likelihood is not. So that's a, big, that's a big change in consideration. My colleague would say then that, is, that example is so condemning to p-values that it's worth disregarding the entire idea. I don't go that far because I find p-values kind of useful, but um, but they're 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 definitely highly different concepts, p-values and likelihood. In fact, um, I have an interesting anecdote. That one of the uh, there's a this principle that says that the likelihood is the unique container of evidence in the data regarding the uh, parameter that you're interested in. And that principle is called the likelihood principle. It's a highly controversial theorem in statistics. It's a theorem with a correct proof. And it's a highly controversial theorem in statistics. And uh, one of the kind of world's most famous statisticians was, was visiting our department. And one of the reasons people don't like it is because it, it, it you know, this likelihood principle says that in, in many ways that, that p-values are non-evidentiary and are thus problematic in that sense. Um, and, but people like p-values. So at any rate, um, I asked this person, his name was D.R. Cox, and, I, and, I, and the subject of this likelihood principle came up and um, he said, oh, I don't think the likelihood principle is true. And I was very surprised about this. So I asked him, I said, oh, but Dr. Cox, um, it has a mathematically correct proof. How can it not be true? And, and I and, and, and I said, well, what's you know what's incorrect about it? And he thought for a minute and he said the conclusion. Uh, so uh, any rate, the the but there's actually people. Um, there's a great and, and she's she's a blogger too. There's a great philosopher 
um, who writes about the philosophy of uh, statistical inference. Uh, her name is Deborah Mayo, and I think her blog is called Error Statistics. She's highly condemning of the likelihood principle, very highly condemning of the likelihood principle. So if you want someone who has a kind of a, a counter uh, idea, you should read her blog. It's this this stuff, the, the thinking about p-values and stuff like that, th this is like catnip for statisticians. Um, they love talking about this stuff. Um, you know, so one thing I would say is in a practical data analysis, don't let, you know, a hundred years of statistical philosophical wrangling prevent you from moving forward and making practical progress. Um, that would be one important bit of advice I would give. Um, thanks for running this course. It's great so far, so thank you for the kind words. Uh, I'm a bit confused by the use of algebraic ma manipulations with random variables. Can you just treat them as normal variables? Um, yes. In, in, in a lot of ways, yes. So if you say x is a random variable, and that means it's a number. Uh, but what it means is it's, it's a potentially unrealized number, right? If I, if I say x is going to be the result of a coin flip, well, it, where, that I've coded as 0 or 1, um, then that x, you know, that, that x can, can have all of the standard rules of a, a, a standard number, right? It can be added and multiplied and squared and square rooted and all these other things. What's interesting about x, though, it, is that it has other properties, right? Because it only depends, you know, it it, it depends on um, probability, and it it has all these different possible potential realizations. So it has things that a number does not have, right? Like an expected value, like a variance, like a density or a mass function associated with it. So these are all added things. So random variables are variables. They behave, they have, they satisfy all the numeric properties that regular variables have, but they have extra properties. And those extra properties describe the fact that they have, you know, all these potential realizations. Okay? And that's where the difference comes in. So between a random variable and a scalar, right? Um, so maybe try and think of it this way. Um, How about R? R makes my brain hurt uh, compared to Python, but I, I still like it. Well, maybe you know, maybe it's like building up a muscle. Maybe it's like that, so that as you lift weights, um, it'll get stronger, and then at some point you'll say, um, you know, thinking in R is second nature. But I I think it's it's that's a funny comment because you know R has a R has a kind of a funny syntax, right? If you're used to programming in other languages, like if, you know, if you're like me, my, historically before I used R, I, you know, I programmed in Pascal and Fortran and C and C++ and Java a little bit. And the best programming course I ever took was in Scheme or Lisp. That one was phenomenal. Great class. And Scheme or Lisp is very different from the rest of those languages. At any rate, when I first learned R, I, I struggled with a lot of the ways that you're thinking. Is it, it's 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 a very weird language. Uh, however, I would say that whenever I kind of think, whenever I ask myself, "Oh, wow, can I do this in R? Can I pass this strange construct to a function?" And do you know, R always lets me do it in a way that, that other kind of high-level languages like MATLAB often don't. Um, let's see. Um, how would this course help a banker? I'm not 100% sure I know what bankers do, really, to be honest. I mean, if you're a banker and you analyze data, then it would help you, right? Um, uh, so, I mean, I think there's lots of different variations of what bankers do, um, as far as I know. If, you know, what I would say is my understanding, actually, is that the financial sector is th they're highly dedicated to hiring a lot of people who are specialists in analytics, or you know, analysis and analytics, and not just um, econometrics, right? I think I think you would know if you were an econometrician that you need to know the set of econometrics tools, and that's what you need to know. Many of them overlap with what we're teaching in this class, but really, there's there's a separate set of tools. You would need to know things like time series that we don't cover. 
But in addition to those folks, the folks that do econometrics and things like that, that I presume bankers would, would want, um, in addition to the investment folks who have the, their own set of tools that they need, many of them depending on statistics, but not exactly the same as what we're teaching in this class. Um, banks, as far as I know, are also highly invested now because they have such large anal um, 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 you know, expansive operations, uh, need people who have kind of standard data science data scientist tools. Um, so I, I, I'm presuming, you know, it's kind of a generic, it's kind of a hard question to directly answer, but I think many people in the banking industry will need to have data science tools like this, um, even apart from the, the, the specialized people that we all know work in banks, like econometricians and financial experts and accountants and all these other people who have their own set of uh, I mean, data science and analysis tools, but but I think even people who you know know how to analyze you know web analytics and that sort of thing, uh, I think are are probably crucial to the banking industry. Is my guess. Uh, so I don't know. My answer is I don't know because <laughs> um, I don't work in banking. But it, it's you know um, I'm confident that they need people with statistics skills. Um, I was wondering if you could use regression for predicting consumer behavior. Sure, I, sure. Regression, regression should be your number one choice for prediction. Before you try anything fancy, try regression, and then try fancier regression, and then try something else. Okay, but regression should be number one. And um, yeah, regression should be number one because it, if regression works well, if a regression gets you 95% of the way there, then that 95% is highly interpretable. You have coefficients. You can not just do a good prediction, but you can interpret how the variables relate to that prediction very easily. So you get this huge benefit to a regression prediction equation over a machine learning prediction equation. However, sometimes machine learning, machine learning will almost always beat regression, but if it only beats it by a little bit, then you're paying a huge cost for that loss in interpretability. Okay, but if it beats it by a lot, then you, you should use the the full you know deep learning or or whatever algorithm you're using, um, use that. But before you do that, see how good how good you can get re with regression. Um, and I think often you would be surprised that that you know multivariate models are are pretty killer at at prediction when combined with some sensible model selection strategy. Um, because we're good at thinking about things, right? We, we, you know, the computers are good about thinking about things too, but we're still very good about doing it as well. <laughs> I've done uh, so. I've done C, Fortran, Pascal, at least three versions of assembly language, Python, Matlab, and I still think R will continue to make my brain hurt. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, are you familiar with the Chow test for structural change? Can you explain the steps? I'm afraid I'm not familiar with that test, so I'm, I can't answer that. That uh, uh, the, the, uh. okay. So this question: Can we please have uh, cover how to have different priors in the parameters of the lit? So, so that's an interesting question. So, um, I, I probably can't do that for this first run of the class, where you know, where it's it's a bit madness right now. Um, but the but the broader term of your statement is is I'd like to see some Bayesian regression and Bayesian regression is not that hard if you're willing to assume normality on the parameters everything has a closed form so um, yeah so that's a great suggestion in future in some future iteration of the class I will add Bayesian regression and it's not to me I've never been I've never concerned myself so much with just to answer your question I've never concerned myself in Bayesian regression with how the how the prior is the distribution on it I've more concerned myself with how spread out the prior is so what I would do is I would do your I would make your prior more and more flat and then when you do that you'll get more of the likelihood and less of the prior and you can see as you as you vary that variance on the prior how that changes your inference so that's what I would suggest to do over trying lots of different distributions. Trying lot, for the slope parameters, that's not going to change much because the slope parameters should be well estimated. For the variance components, sometimes 
you can have problems as you change the prior. But there's and there's some strategies for that. I would just say you know switch between a couple of canonical priors. So for the inverse of the variance, switch between um, a, a gamma distribution or a, you know a, a log normal distribution. A couple other things um, to try and see how sensitive your conclusions are to the choice of the prior on the variance component. But for the slope parameters, they hopefully will not be that much. That um, if they're well identified, they they shouldn't be that that um, sensitive to the prior choice and so work on diffuseness not of the prior not so much worrying uh, about um, the actual shape of the distribution. Um, let's see how did I let's see if I can figure that this question out lines p values um, p values divided by p hat uh, oh, okay. This um, this question it basically so p vowels is not p values from this is I think this is a, a lecture in boot camp two. Um, p vowels is not the p value. The p vowels was was a set of values of p, <laughs> if that makes any sense, between zero and one. So I just wanted to plot a likelihood, and I picked points between 0 and 1. So p vowels is a vector of points between 0 and 1. And then if imagine if I were to get rid of this p hat part, then I would just be executing the binomial likelihood where x is the data and n is the sample size. Okay? Dividing by the p hat just normalizes it so that likelihood is 1. In that case, you know exactly p hat, you know that x over n p hat is exactly where the maximum occurs. So I just took the binomial formula, which is p to the x, 1 minus p to the n minus x, and divided it by p hat to the x, 1 minus p hat to the n minus x, and that normalizes the likelihood so it peaks out at 1. And that helps because the likelihood, it's kind of unit free, so you want it to have a, um, you, want it to, you want it to be um, normalized at some level and, and setting it so that the peak is 1 is, is, a, way to, is a way to go. So thanks for the discussion about p-values. Um, if, if you're interested in this more, um, there's a great discussion about p-values in Richard Royal's book. So I would look at Richard's, Richard Royal's book. It's super fun to read. It's a bit technical, but it's still super fun to read if you're interested in this. And there's tons of stuff on this about this on the internet. So if you just look in controversy over p-values or um, interest over p-values, you know, any Google search on p-values will lead you in the right direction on these things. Okay. Could you give us some hints on the R codes of quiz two in question six in regression models? So this will be the last question, um, but let me look it up. Uh, regression models, quiz two, quiz two, question six. Question six. And, uh, Uh, mm. So, um, okay, so this is that question really boils down to you want to look at the units of the x having been changed. So look in the lecture notes um, from the regression class in the in the in the in the in the in the lecture where the units of the x has been changed. And I think the, the code is actually I, I think pretty much the code is actually in there. And remember from the lecture note, there's two ways that you can change the units and get of x and and and, and get the right answer. One is you could actually just change the units and fit the linear regression with the x with the correct units that you want. The other is to fit it with the x that you have and change the units of the of the fitted coefficient that you get out. Okay, and just keep track of units and you'll get the right answer. It's it's that easy. You know, it's it's that easy. So look back on the regression lecture on changing units in a in a linear regression, and that'll that'll give you that'll get you well on your way to solving that problem. Okay, so thanks everyone for coming to the office hours, and uh, I'll see you next week.